Uh, welcome to the Cilium Maintainers Track session. Um, I'm Bill Mulligan, uh, I work at Isovalent, and joining me on stage are Ahmed from New York Times, Joe from Ascend, and Anna also from Isovalent. Uh, thanks for coming today. So just as a quick show of hands, how many people in here use Cilium? Okay, awesome, that's great to see. Um, and how many people have never heard of Cilium? Okay, a few hands too. So hopefully this will be interesting for both groups. So if you haven't heard of Cilium before, um, Cilium began as a networking project uh, providing layer three and layer four connectivity as a Kubernetes CNI. Uh, once we kind of expanded beyond that, we started to include network observability with the subproject Hubble, and the project has expanded once again to also include security observability and runtime enforcement with Tetragon. So when you think about Cilium, what it does is it provides cloud-native networking, observability, and security. And all of this technology is built on top of eBPF. And eBPF is a Linux kernel technology that allows you to flexibly and efficiently and safely modify what's happening in the Linux kernel. And that's what makes the whole Cilium family of projects so powerful, is being built on top of eBPF. So a quick update from the project. Uh, Cilium is now at 20,000 stars on GitHub. I think that's pretty cool. But this is actually a bit of a vanity metric. You know, all you have to do is like click the button there. I think what's actually more exciting for me as one of the maintainers of the project is the contributors to the project. So CNCF just actually recently re uh, released a Cilium project journey report, and we can really see both the growth in the number of contributing companies and the number of contributors, and really saying that companies all around the ecosystem are buying into and contributing to Cilium. And this is really exciting for me because it means more contributions means we have a better project to give to all the people that are using it, like you. Uh, on top of that, the velocity uh, around Cilium is also in increasing too. So this is the number of authors, the number of commits, the number of PRs, the number of issues, that's increasing too. So even though Cilium is almost 10 years old, the energy, the momentum behind the project is continuing to increase. I think that's really exciting about the project too. And besides just the contributors, uh, the important thing is all the end users who's used the project too. And so right now, Cilium, uh, if you go to the website right now, you can find that there's 153 public users that have said, yes, I'm using Cilium, I'm using it in production, here are my use cases, I, this is why I love the project. And on top of that, there's 74 public case stories about this project. So that's different things like blog posts, case studies, and talks. So if you're interested in about hearing actually how people are using Cilium in the real world, and it's not just kind of this marketing hype, these GitHub stars, I'd recommend checking out any of these public uh, users of Cilium. On top of that, uh, as another further proof point, uh, the CNCF just at the keynotes this morning released the newest technology radar about multi-cluster management, and Cilium received the highest usefulness score. And this is made up from end users from the CNCF ecosystem. I think that's a really good testament to how uh, impactful Cilium is as a project, that in the whole CNCF ecosystem, it's the most recommended project for multi-cluster management. So uh, that's a little bit about the uh, growth and energy around the project. Now I'm gonna go into quick updates from the Cilium 1.16 uh, release, which just happened recently. So on the networking side, uh, Cilium now includes NetKit support. And this, I think this is really exciting because previously containers had a bit of overhead uh, in terms of uh, the network. But with NetKit, container networking is just as fast as host networking. Uh, Cilium also supports service tra traffic distribution, which is a successor to topology-aware routing and has multi-cast uh, multi support. On the service mesh uh, and gateway API so side, Cilium now supports gateway API 1.1 and Gamma, which is for east-west traffic management in the cluster. And the L7 Envoy Proxy is now its own dedicated daemon set to ease the life cycle of managing Envoy Proxy if you're using it for L7. Uh, on the security side, uh, Cilium now supports port ranges for network policies and network, fo uh, network policy policy validation. Uh, so I know a lot of people rely on Cilium network policies to do things like micro segmentation and zero trust networking, and this is a great addition to that. 
On the Tetragon side, uh, Tetragon now includes Kubernetes identity aware policies and redaction filters for events. Uh, and then the last thing uh, is around day two operations and scale, right? As we're running at bigger clusters, we're always trying to improve how the project is working too. And so uh, a couple of the updates, we've had a 5x reduction in tail latency for DNS-based network policies and reduced the memory usage of Cilium 2. So a lot of exciting things. It's great to see all the momentum behind the project and all the great updates from the project and the latest releases. I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, continue in the next releases coming up. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ahmed to talk about how they use Cilium at the New York Times. Cool. Thank you, Bill. So as you can see, uh, my name is Ahmed Babars. I'm a principal engineer at the New York Times. Uh, and I do infrastructure, Kubernetes and other things. And I do other things like scuba diving, so let's talk after. Uh, but big part of what we do, as you know about the New York Times, we do news. So we are very expert in journalism. But we also have other portfolio and set of products. So we do games. If you play Wordle, uh, cross B, uh, uh, sorry, Crossword, Spelling Bee, other games, cooking, and the wire cutter. And this is just a start about what we do at the New York Times. So why are we using Cilium? So I'm just gonna give you like a quick five minutes on the why. So we run a multi-account architecture. What that mean is that like every product engineering team gets set of accounts that they use. So we have a very integrated network, uh, kind of isolated, but like they still can route to each other. So this help us to scale our platform. And when we start to think about like how we gonna do this with Kubernetes and centralize our Kubernetes architecture, we thought like, okay, the multi-account architecture works, but for order to go for a centralized Kubernetes architecture, we have to go through something like this. So what that mean is that like we operate as a team and then as an organization, our uh, Kubernetes cluster on a multi-region, uh, bare environment that depends. And you can see like some of the open source projects that we are using currently right now, like Cilium is the top one because uh, I'll go in details why are we using Cilium. We also use Carpenter, Istio, and other projects, and that's how we set uh, our infrastructure on top of EKS. So why are we using Cilium? So we run a multi-account, multi-tenant architecture. So strong network isolation is a critical part for how we do networking on our side. So. This is like how we do controllers. We, so we have a, our custom controller at the New York Times that like onboard uh, teams into the cluster. And as you can see, there's like a Cilium network policies that isolate specific accounts on the cloud to specific namespaces and specific tenants. Also like you can see that the Cilium network wide policies that we apply for DNS. So strong network isolation is a critical part when we start our journey about three years ago. The other thing that it's very important to us and to our security team is the flows and the metric. So it's really important to understand like what's happening when we run a multi-tenant uh, clusters. Like we have a lot of tenants, we have a lot of applications, so we need to understand the isolation element of it. We need to understand how that flows. Also, like Hubble is very helpful for debugging. I ran into many issues personally where like, okay, just go there and then Cilium network policy is a problem. Let's see how to we can fix that. The metrics coming outside of the box from uh, Hubble and Cilium itself helps us to understand like where are the pieces that need more work, like how are we regenerating uh, IP addresses and other things. And one of the most important things that we wanted to move to is like when we run into a multi-account architecture with a centralized approach, uh, we were worried about IB exhaustion super early in the process, and that when because most of our accounts are are IB routable, so that means like all services can talk to each other on a specific IBs. We needed to do a thing about nodes can talk to each other, but also bots can talk to each other. So that's where like we're using the ENI mode, and like we have a secondary set of IB addresses on our VBCs that like extend how we can like scale into like thousands of containers and bots on our. Uh, clusters. The other thing that's important and like then listed here, last year we did a talk about cluster mesh, so we also like run Cilium on between regions on the cluster mesh side of things, where it helps us like to run a flat network across regions and do uh, multi-region availability in a, in a good way. 
And with that, uh, like I have done myself and other teams uh, and other persons on the New York Times, like multiple talks uh, at uh, how we build our platform engineer at the New York Times. So these are a couple talks from like the cluster buildings themselves and like how we are also using Cilium and transitioning from Istio to Cilium and Cilium to Istio. Uh, and from here, I will pass it to Joe. Hey, y'all. Uh, so I am Joe. Uh, I work at Ascend.io. Uh, I'm an infrastructure lead uh, among a number of other engineering efforts. Um, Ascend is a company that offers a uh, platform for data pipeline automation uh, using AI to uh, accelerate user development and democratize data engineering. So. Jumping into a bit of what drove us to actually use Celium. We've been using it for about five years. Um, and it's really key because there's a few things about our architecture. Uh, so we process data. In order to process data, you have to actually be able to get to the data. In a lot of cases, the data that we're getting to is in private VPCs, in legacy networks. Um, so both for cost reasons and for privacy and security reasons, we would actually co-locate with the customer's data, uh, in many cases deploying into their cloud accounts, um, and would need to be able to uh, install directly into their private networks. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, compliance requirements, as many people do. Uh, we handle things like PII and PHI, uh, and as you're doing that, that embeds a number of things that you have to guarantee about your networking um, as you are delivering your product. Uh, finally, as with, again, everyone, uh, performance on the data path, if you're pushing around bytes, you've got to be able to push them around quickly uh, because ain't nobody got time to not do that. Uh, so specifically about the actual infrastructure, um, we run on top of Kubernetes. Uh, we run on the three primary clouds, on Google, Amazon, and Azure. Uh, and in order to actually do that, um, we run, we minimize our operations by running on the managed case providers. So that's your GKE, your EKS, your AKS. Um, and for any of you who have run on more than one of those may know, they all offer their own implementations for uh, networking. Uh, and learning all of those and being able to debug all of those on the fly in the case of a production outage is a lot to ask of your operations team, particularly if you're running a lean team. Uh, so as we were actually looking at the challenge of performing these operations and making sure that everything continued to work on day two, uh, we weighed the cost trade-offs, we looked around at the options, and determined that having, that managing our own network layer was sufficiently sensible uh, as a trade-off against having to deal with the different uh, network interfaces that are provided by each of the cloud providers. Um, Celium at that time was already compatible with all the cloud providers. Uh, this was all before Dataplane v2 or anything for GKE or BYOC and I, so it was a wild west. Um, but uh, so we were able to drop Celium in, and it gave us that consistent networking layer. Um, in particular. Uh, being able to actually debug network policy was something that we discovered very, very early on. Uh, we could sink a ton of time into. Um, there were a couple times people had to pull out Wireshark, and for those of you who know, uh, you can actually migrate to Celium in about the time it takes to debug something with Wireshark. So just choose that. Uh, if you are actually using Celium for network policy debugging, the Hubble UI legitimately reduces the potential time waste on uh, network policy debugging down from potentially days to seconds, and I, that's not an exaggeration. I've, I've done it. <laughs> so I mentioned that we do install into customer private networks. Uh, many customers that we're dealing with have legacy networks that are very highly sharded and very IP saturated. Uh, so being able to actually walk in and install is not necessarily something that's guaranteed. Uh, and something about the built-in networking interfaces for all the cloud providers is that they all actually prefer to do what's known as native routing, where every single pod uh, receives its own IP directly in the actual VPC. So as we were going into these conversations, we were meeting network architects about how to do the install, and we were asking for 
16,000 IPs, or uh, what's the, sorry, 65,000 IPs, about a slash 16. Um, and we were frequently just getting told they didn't have that. They, they couldn't actually make that happen for us. Uh, so one of the benefits of Celium is that you can perform uh, masquerading of your pods so that rather than costing about 256 IPs per node, you actually only cost one. Uh, and that made it so that we could just request a bat slash 24, have plenty of room for scalability for our uh, customers, and be able to perform installs very, very quickly with very little contention with the actual networking team. Uh, I mentioned earlier compliance requirements. Uh, so we had to do this for HIPAA uh, because we process PHI, uh, but there's many reasons to have encryption transit, including it's just a good security practice. Uh, initially, when we rolled this out, we actually had rolled our own solution using cert init containers and TLS approver, uh, which was very flaky, uh, added a lot of bootstrap time to actually all of our pods because they all had to have their own init container that was requesting these uh, per pod certs. Um, and we were depending on this core service to be able to approve all those on the fly. Uh, it, it just didn't work super well and we weren't very happy with it. Uh, so once we saw that IPsec was available and we could just turn it on in Celium, uh, we switched over to that and never looked back. Um, we moved again when WireGuard became available. Uh, we did see, honestly, no issues with IPsec, but we looked at the implementation of WireGuard, saw that there were fewer moving pieces than IPsec, because it's just based on the public keys for the nodes. Uh, moved over to WireGuard and still no problems. So big thumbs up there. Uh, and finally, performance, the fun part. Uh, so as Bill already mentioned, uh, NetKit was just released. This gives you the full performance of the actual node for your throughput. Uh, you're, you're getting node level performance from your containers. Um, there is another additional technology of big TCP, uh, which may be a little less familiar because it's further out on the kernel horizon. Um, but this basically packs a lot more data in per packet. Uh, with just much larger packets. Um, so you get significantly more throughput um, without having to change anything in your application or, or any of that. Uh, so the fun part of this is as you do get new kernels showing up uh, in your Kates cluster, uh, you actually just get more features from Celium that depended on those kernel features. Uh, so it's a little bit of a present that shows up on a regular cadence. Uh, so again, I'm from Ascend. Um, keep an eye out on our site for uh, product announcements. I've got links up there for our Corp site and our LinkedIn, uh, along with a link to the case study that we did with Isovalent. And I'll hand it off to Anna. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about Tetragon. So I'm Anna, I work at Isovalent uh, on observability projects, mainly uh, Hubble and Tetragon. And uh, today I'm gonna uh, maybe introduce Tetragon to some of you, I assume, and uh, give updates for those of you who already uh, heard about it. So Tetragon is a open source project under Celium umbrella. It's um, a bit younger than Cilium uh, CNI itself. Uh, it extends Cilium functionality in uh, observability and security area. Um, so it's a runtime uh, security observability and enforcement project that at its core, it's really a pretty generic tool to hook into uh, any eBPF hook in Linux kernel and produce events and metrics uh, or enforce when this hook is executed. Uh, Tetragon can be used for many, many, many different use cases. Uh, here on this picture, you can see some of them, uh, things like process execution, network calls, uh, file access, uh, various Linux operations uh, that can be used to for privilege escalations. Um, it's uh, producing uh, events and that Prometheus metrics that then can be processed in uh, any CM or observability vendor that you are using. And um, it uh, works uh, on many Linux uh, distributions. Uh, it's also language agnostic, so it uh, will monitor applications, user space applications, no matter what 
um, application language they are written in. Um, so Tetragon uh, is configured via policies that are, as I said, pretty low level. We are operating on uh, kernel functions and their arguments there. And because writing Tetragon po low level policies can be difficult uh, if you're not a kernel developer, we started this community maintained uh, examples directory in Tetragon repository. So if you want to get started with Tetragon, this is a good place to start, uh, examples directory. And if you are using Tetragon, we also encourage you to uh, share your policies there. Um, it's, it's now pretty large collection of community policies for many different use cases that different organizations have. Um, in Tetragon documentation, there is also so-called policy library, uh, which is kind of more documented uh, the collection of, of example policies for specific use cases. So check those out too. Uh, new features in Tetragon. So uh, there are a couple of new features introduced um, over past uh, few months. Uh, first of all, enforcement. Uh, the enforcement bit is in Tetragon from the beginning, but uh, one gotcha with enforcement was that when Tetragon agent restarts, for example, because you upgrade Tetragon version, the Tetragon would unload all the VPF part and then load it again when it starts again. This means that Tetragon doesn't enforce anything while the user space agent starts. Um, Security engineers don't like it. They really don't like when you tell them, oh, by the way, we have like gaps in enforcement. Uh, so this was a blocker for some people. Now it's fixed. Uh, now Tetragon will uh, keep the BPF part in kernel while the user space agent, for example, is updated. And we also uh, introduced more robust integration between uh, BPF part and Kubernetes using uh, OCI um, uh, hooks. Um, Yesterday, we gave a talk with my colleague Cornelius about uh, enforcement in Tetragon. So uh, if you missed it and you are interested in, in this part, then uh, watch the recording. Um, there are a few other new features, support for uh, Linux security modules, uh, user stack traces. So uh, using uh, Tetragon, you can attach stack traces, both user stack traces and kernel stack traces to produced events. Uh, in, um, you, by you doing this, you can use Tetragon, for example, for profiling. Uh, we've been seeing people using Tetragon as sort of a building block for a profiler. So they take these Tetragon events with stack traces and then process stack traces to um, generate a flame graph and reduction filters on events for sensitive data. Uh, the Tetragon uh, is still Pretty young project, much younger than Cilium CNI, but it's growing. Uh, we have uh, over 100 contributors, over uh, 4,000 commits, and almost 4,000 stars, I believe now, and a three months release cadence. So uh, yeah, the next release should be um, about around the somewhere in December, I believe. Um, we have a contrib fest today, uh, so it's first ever Tetragon contrib fest. If you are interested in contributing to Tetragon, in help, get help, getting help to get started, uh, writing policies, or just discussing your ideas with us, then uh, please come. It's today afternoon. We have quite a few Tetragon developers and maintainers over here, over here, so um, it should be fun. And. Uh, to stay in touch, we have a community meeting. Tetragon community meeting is happening monthly. Uh, you can find all information uh, on the uh, link uh, that's on the slides. And we are also on Slack, uh, Cilium and TBPF Slack, Tetragon channel. Uh, we are there. Uh, we are very happy to answer questions and help you uh, with, yeah, using Tetragon. So that's it from me. With that, I will pass it to Bill again. Thanks, Anna. Um, and then we just have a couple updates from the Cilium community. So on Monday, we hosted the second 
Cilium Developer Summit. Uh, this is a really great way to bring together all the maintainers and contributors uh, of the project into one room. Uh, we had a lot of great discussions. I'm really excited for the future of the project coming out of this, and I'd like to give a big shout out to Google for hosting us. Uh, on top of that, uh, Cilium has 12 new case studies from the CNCF. So the, all the public companies I was talking about at the beginning, uh, and the one that we did with Joe, for example, um, earlier, uh, there's 12 more of them uh, from the CNCF out now. Um, and then a little bit from the eBPF community. Um, so I also work with the eBPF Foundation, and since this is an un the underlying technology of all the Cilium projects, we've been doing a lot of work to make sure that eBPF is a safe and secure technology um, to deploy into production. And so the eBPF Foundation funded a verifier audit, um, and they found one CVE, and the community has fixed that too. But I think this verifier audit is great because it really speaks to the amount of work and effort that has gone into securing this really key technology uh, to Cilium. On top of that, the eBPF Foundation also recently launched an eBPF threat model. Um, and this gives you a good insight into how to think about deploying eBPF into production and what you need to do when thinking about uh, the different threats that your organization may face uh, when thinking about uh, eBPF. Um, I, I think really the key quote from this is that eBPF increases security over traditional approaches like updating the kernel or doing kernel modules because of its rigorous validation of user supplied code, right? And that's the eBPF verifier that verifies the code, and that's what we did the third party audit on. So I, I think we're really doing a lot to continue to improve the safety of eBPF as a technology, and I'm excited to continue that work um, going forward with the eBPF Foundation too. Uh, on top of that, if you're using Cilium, I know a bunch of people raised their hands at the beginning of this too. Uh, we currently have a Cilium user survey out. Uh, this is uh, us as the project maintainers asking you um, as the end users what you'd like to see from the project. Uh, please fill this out, uh, give us feedback. It helps us direct the future direction of the project. Uh, on top of that, if you want to, if you're excited from this session and want to learn more or show how much you know about Cilium, the Linux Foundation has a certification, the Certified Cilium Associate. Um, go earn this to show what you know about it. If you'd like to connect more with the community, uh, we also have a developer meeting for Cilium, and it's Wednesday at um, uh, 5, and there's also an APAC-friendly one, too. Finally, if you got excited about this and want to contribute to the community, check out the Cilium uh, contributor ladder for ways to get started. Uh, it's been great uh, being a part of the Cilium project at, at KubeCon. Uh, we've had 22 different talks. There's a project kiosk here in the maintainers track session right now. Uh, scan this code to find out all the other things that have happened or are going to happen at the project uh, <clears throat> for the rest of the conference. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for coming, uh, and we'll open it up for questions. Hey guys, awesome presentation, thank you. Um, there's a bit of a, a question born out of ignorance. I haven't used Cilium, haven't dug into it. One of the things that we are dealing with is a multi-cloud environment. We can't deploy Cilium, Calico, whatever, in all of them. So what we have said is we're going to deal with whatever the Kubernetes policy generically offers. So I know just recently, and that's one of the things we're gonna give a small talk on tomorrow, or today, the admin network policies that the networking SIG has made available. Uh, do you know Cilium is intending to support those? That's coming. Uh, so if we say, hey, I want everything in my cluster in, in this zero trust model to be able to reach this thing, uh, will Cilium as a CNI under the covers just do the right thing? Yeah, so the question is, are we gonna support admin network policy? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So anything that upstream Kubernetes um, and like CNI as a spec supports, we're gonna implement that in Cilium too. Um, so Cilium supports all Kubernetes network policies, and has additional like Cilium network policies on top for stuff like uh, L7 and FQDN based things, and as additional things come into upstream, we'll also implement them in Cilium. Actually, uh, like for instance, like one of my colleagues at Isovalent is actually one of the maintainers of the CNI spec. So we're as closely aligned with upstream as we can be. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, just had a quick question about the scale that we've tested Cilium with um, on, let's say, a single cluster across any cloud provider. What the max number of nodes Cilium has been able to support across the board? Let's say 3,000, 5,000, or? Yeah. Um, so there's actually a bunch of talks about people running Cilium at significant scale. So I would check out the ones from uh, Datadog has a lot of public talks about it. Um, they actually spoke at Cilium and eBPF Day about some of the things that they're doing for scalability. And actually at KubeCon China last year, Alibaba also talked about some of the stuff that they're doing for scalability. Um, so those are the public ones. Like less publicly, I know some Cilia, uh, Cilium users are scaling it up to 50 or 60,000 node clusters. Um, and that's actually for AI training workloads. Uh, so there are a lot of considerations <laughs> when you want to scale something that big, right? Because even Kubernetes itself is not especially designed for 50,000 node clusters, but it is something uh, that the project is working on. And we do have users doing that stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of scalability, and a lot of that comes back to using eBPF as the foundation for the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, similar to like the previous question, some of my ignorance, I haven't used Hubble as much as I should have uh, for debugging. And but like for the uh, part of the talk about the some of the multi-cloud usage, like does Hubble solve for me what I need to debug across multi-cloud? Is that the right tool, strategy, thought process when I'm debugging in these kind of more complex environments? Uh, yeah, so it, it'll it'll work on any cloud because it's it effectively is going to treat the network as uh, an independent abstraction from Kubernetes. Um, if you if you're looking at like a multi-cloud workload that is spanning across clouds, um, if, if you're like looking at between clusters, then I think you'll be looking at cluster mesh, which I believe it should be compatible with. Yeah. Um, so yes. Uh, one thing to add to this, so the Hubble metrics are super helpful and like you can see, but like if you use the Hubble flow logs, actually it's one of the most extensive logs that you can get for networking. Usually if you do like any Wireshark stuff, you're just like gonna see like TCP stuff. We do it uh, often on the VPC logs, but it's not too uh, dense to see like which buds are talking to which buds. So like if you log this, so what we do at the New York Times, we log off our Hubble flow logs to our sim, which we can review at any point of time, like which part talking to which part, and all IP addresses, and we can visualize that as needed. So it helps, depends on like, are they talking to public IP addresses, private IP addresses, but we can fully have an understanding of where is the traffic is going, how it's going, like if it's denied or not, and what type of traffic is happening on the clusters. Cool, thanks. Last call for questions. Okay, thanks everyone for coming.